Uh, okay, I think we can start. Uh, hello, welcome to my presentation. Uh, there's not that much of you here. At some point I thought maybe we could go to a bar and just talk about performance and complain uh, about the weather. Uh, okay, but there's too many of you, so no. Uh, I like when my presentation somehow uh, is connected to a theme of the whole conference or maybe some other presentations. It, it, makes, it makes it uh, part of uh, some bigger whole. And uh, I was very glad when uh, Bur Sutter uh, at the keynote uh, pointed out that the um, economics of the um, software uh, development has changed uh, compared now to some few decades ago. Uh, it was keynote, so probably you all have been there. Uh, he said that a few decades ago, uh, when someone wanted to start a software project, uh, what it took is to buy a few servers, buy some uh, databases, uh, licenses, then more server, more databases, more licenses. It amounted to hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, capital expenditure to start the project. And right now, what you need is just a laptop and an account on some cloud uh, vendor uh, where you can buy servers for, uh, for cents per hour, right? Uh, but uh, make no mistake, uh, developing software, developing pro software products is still very expensive. It just it doesn't go to hardware vendors uh, or uh, Larry Ellison Yachts. It goes to uh, wetware instead of software and hardware. So it means us. And it's good, right? We like being paid a lot. It's just that the uh, economies uh, of pro uh, the change of economies of producing uh, such products uh, change, uh, changes how this is done and how uh, the people are used, how other, uh, how the companies the, uh, that in invest in us and buy us to make, make products, how they look on uh, allocating of people. So uh, in this presentation, I will show you this impact, a few uh, words about how this transformed, uh, how, the, how we work and what kind of skill set is needed from developers in such circumstances. And then we will go on a road trip to find out actually if there are uh, cases when we want to actually invest those people into uh, doing uh, performance optimization and what it takes for us, for developers, what skill set is, is needed and knowledge to actually do this performance optimization in uh, a way that is, brings the most value to customers or to, to, to companies we work, work for. A few words about me. I'm Tomasz. I work in Codewise. Right now I'm heading a small startup founded by Codewise. It's called Tornimo.io. It's a service as a service for monitoring applications. Uh, when I worked at Codewise, uh, I, called my, uh, I was a tech lead, some organization called it uh, engineering manager, and uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I like to call myself failed tech lead. Why? Well, if uh, you join a small startup company that grows and achieves success, then suddenly you have uh, 100 people in the company, there are teams, and uh, initial developers are natural fits for leading those teams, but are rarely ready. So I went uh, on the internet to read about what actually engineer manager should do or shouldn't do, and I found this uh, little uh, article, uh, how to fail as an engineer manager in eight easy steps. So I started reading and I failed in the first step, keep coding, uh, so I kept coding. If you've seen the um, quality presentation by uh, Chet Hasse, you know that I'm one of those managers who still think uh, that can code, uh, and I do it sometimes. Uh, fortunately, uh, I have skin in a game, which means I am on call as, uh, together with my team, so maybe that makes this code not that uh, terrible. Uh, when I was rehearsing for this presentation, I looked at my 
history of my projects, the products that I created, uh, maintained, optimized. And my uh, constatation was that uh, I spent about half of my career optimizing allocations in Java. Uh, I should rethink my life choices, right? So this was very sad. Let's visualize it. Okay. Uh, and you, you see this lady doesn't want to optimize allocations anymore. She just want to go to Bishchade. Uh This is a front page of a small conference called FADS. And uh, uh, FAD is something that is, well, uh, short-lived, overhyped uh, thing that's actually empty and doesn't bring any benefit. It's short, in this case, for failed aspirations in database systems. Ignore the database part. It was uh, just a mini conference at the database conference, but what this conference was about is failed aspirations. So imagine conference that actually is about failures. It's not about new technologies, it's not about selling you a new kind of software or taking your pri private data so they can send you uh, job offers. It's about failed systems. And uh, uh, you can submit a paper or uh, presentation uh, there uh, when you talk about a system you worked on that seemed like a good idea but turned terribly wrong. Some of things they discussed was like XML databases there. But uh, there are, there's a lot of other stuff, right? Uh, Corba, right? Uh, uh, SOAP, uh, I don't know, maybe using uh, JSON to communicate microservices, like sending terabytes of ASCII uh, characters to communicate robots. It makes sense, right? Uh, maybe it will be, uh, uh, someone will tell you this at the next installment. Actually, let's make a call for papers for this conference. Who wants to say something about their failed projects? Thanks. One, two, three. Okay, we almost have one day of conference. I will make a keynote because it's easy to laugh at other failed projects or other failed technologies, but it's harder to, to uh, talk about my own. Uh, a short story uh, from uh, CodeWise, my team, uh, we had an internal client. It's a great thing. Internal client, a guy who knows the business, he's always right, who will come to you and say, okay, this part of software is great, you should develop this and this, and I know the market, so this will work. Right? What can go wrong? He was right most of the time, but at some point he came to us and said, look, we develop all this uh, analytical software for our clients, and our clients use it all day long. Maybe we should, instead of, uh, uh, we should make it simpler for them, just analyze it for, uh, for them and show them the summary. So it was just before the AI craze. Right now we would call it uh, cutting edge AI, machine learning stuff, and everyone will throw money at us. But it was before this. So uh, we started this project. It was, in a way, agile. So there were iterations. We talked to our internal client. We showed him the results. He said, OK, OK, that's it. Uh, and by the way, uh, the feedback from clients, uh, if you have uh, Good feedback is not feedback, right? It does not tell you what to improve, what to uh, develop. If you have uh, bad feedback, that's a good feedback because you can act on it. If you have no feedback, then this is bad feedback because the client does, just doesn't care about what, what you released. And we were working on this project. It was very f a lot of fun. We had terabytes of data to process per client. We had to uh, learn a lot about kernel, about uh, file systems, SSDs, how JVM works, how, JVM, how can you map uh, like unlimited terabytes of data in JVM, although it uh, usually won't allow you to do it. It was a lot of fun. And to make a long story short, in the end, we reached the product. Client didn't understand it, didn't like it. No one bought it. No one, there was no one paid for this. So that was something uh, 
that was a lot of investment, right? Because the people were, is the, the, the most important uh, and the most uh, expensive thing. And also the uh, cost of opportunity, of lost opportunity, because we could have been working on something better. This slide is from uh, No Fluff Jobs. You probably know it. They have a uh, boot fear. Uh, from their blog two years ago, salaries were about 16, 17,000. That's tops. I think it's very old right now. Uh, developer salary, I mean, the top salary probably is about 19, 20, 21. Uh, Whatever. There's a high frequency trading company in US that uh, was looking for a DBA to optimize their database. They were paying half a million dollars per year for this uh, one person. And uh, so this is pretty expensive. Let's assume that all the costs from the employer is about $10,000 per month for such person. Think about this. If you have a team of eight to 10 people, and uh, they work for one year, it's a million dollars. You look at the teams you work in or around you. Did you uh, think ever that the work you did in one year, did it uh, bring your company one million dollars or, so, or more? That, in that case, this would be a good return on investment, right? Uh, a lot of companies started to uh, trying to optimize, right? That, that's why there are uh, development uh, centers in uh, Krakow. But also uh, in the startup, um, Silicon Valley, the startup uh, places when there's a lot of start startups, people started to describe techniques to optimize this kind of development to make sure that when we hire developers, we better them know what they should do to actually provide a return on investment. One of these books, it's nothing new. I just wanted to point out how, the, how they think, uh, how to test new ideas in just a few days. It's, the sprint is not related to Scrum or Agile. The main idea here is that you have five days, and in five days we validate if your product idea uh, makes sense. These guys who wrote the book are from Google Ventures. So it's a branch of Google that, that invests in startups. And obviously, if they, they invest in startup, they want to help the startup to succeed. Uh, I believe Slack was one of the startups they invested in. So uh, the idea is that uh, on the first day, they look for the clients that will come on Friday, on the fifth day, to look at your product. So you start with probably no product uh, or some, something uh, or a problem that you, that you want to solve. And on Friday, you know there will be clients knocking at your door to look what you uh, propose as a solution. So you have four days to actually design something. Three days is spent on talking to subject matter experts, thinking about the problem, coming up with the solution. And the fourth day, on, f uh, on first day, you got, get to implement it. You have one day out of five to actually do anything software related. And actually, these guys say, OK, if your product is a web page, just make a prior PowerPoint presentation. The clients will think they're clicking on a web page, and it will be just rigged demo. I remember this from the, uh, my studies when uh, there was an end of term and we had to give a project, finish a project, and it wasn't ready, so we just faked it. I thought this was, uh, uh, this was wrong, but actually it was market research. So uh, these are the ways that a lot of companies will try to validate products and make sure that when the developers start working, they will be working on something that is important. Uh, but you might say, OK, but uh, it doesn't matter. It, it's not about quality, right? It doesn't say that you need to, uh, you, you shouldn't do tests or you should write bad code. It's just that you can make this code work by uh, stopping around uh, play, uh, things that are already lying around with minimal invention, minimal uh, optimization. You just put up some product to verify that it works with clients. And if it's, it, it will be probably slow, right? Because it will be bloated, you will put spring, you will put a lot of other stuff there. Uh, well, okay, just buy a bigger server. This is Amazon 
two-year-old server, so probably soon it will be cheaper or there will be much bigger server, 128 CPUs, four, ter uh, four terabytes of RAM, four terabytes of SSD. It costs about 20,000 a month. It's, it's not cheap, but if you reserve it, you will get it for a price of about $10,000. So you can have one developer work on something, or you can add 128 cores to your product. It's similar, right? So the de decision is not that clear cut. You think this server is too small, then a digression, how fast it will, uh, there will be a new one that is enough? Well, here we have an IBM ASCII white supercomputer from 2000 uh, that has 7.2 teraflops. In the second corner, we have NVIDIA Volta gra graphic card for gamers. It has 7.5 teraflops. This is 17 years uh, of progress. And what's more, the supercomputer weights in 100 tons. The graphic card weights in half a kilogram and uses 300 watts, while the supercomputer uses 3 megawatts. So that's the improvement that came in 17 years. So I'm sure if we have a system that's too slow, you can buy more servers. Next year, you can buy more servers even cheaper. Uh, OK, uh, so if companies work like, like this, they need a little different skill set of developers. It's not that they need Scala instead of Java or Kotlin or something like this. They need people who are thinking in a different terms when developing software. So you might have heard about the 10x developer. It's the idea that if you have junior developer and senior developer, senior developer who knows all the tools, knows everything, he can be 10 times as effective. He can produce 10 times more bugs than the, the junior developer, right? Uh, so I want to introduce you to a concept. It's not new, it's not my, my concept, but I think it's used here. It's 0.1x developer. So this is a completely different mindset that is not uh, uh, centered on code, but on client value. So the, such a developer would ask different questions like, let's not add this feature maybe now, okay? Can we, can we just not add it? Or maybe can we fake it so that no one noticed that we uh, didn't implement it? Uh, maybe uh, can we remove some unused feature? I hope you're measuring usage of features in your product so that you know that maybe some of the, them can be removed. Uh, maybe let's not adopt this new technology. Service, service mesh, anyone? Uh, maybe let's not automate, automate this. Or maybe not extract this class into your company commons utils, right? Uh, let's not optimize it yet. Here are some links if you want to, uh, to dig deeper. Uh, but what happens with all this approach? Well, there's a tweet from, from the I found on the internet. In this picture, you have a browser, two tabs. One tab is Gmail. Second tab runs a virtual machine written in Java. This machine uh, uh, in JavaScript. This virtual machine runs Windows 2000, and Windows 2000 runs Internet Explorer. Guess which tab uses more resources? Well, Gmail. So there's something wrong with this picture, right? So it's like uh, Philip K. Dick's uh, Man in the High Castle, right? We see the reality around us. This is the reality, hard reality that is, but there's something wrong with it. Right? Because we would still like to uh, go and write this code, write those new services instead of removing them or using some third-party software. So my team for the same, and we went on a, a trip to try to discover actually when we can invest in optimization and invest actually engineering time to make things better. So we started with, uh, with a very large databases conference. It was in Munich, so it was fun. 
And uh, I, uh, uh, I really uh, enjoyed the conference. I think uh, this is something you, um, I, um, you, you could go there. Uh, the conference is about a database, obviously, but there most papers that you can see in, uh, in the internet were published there. There are vendors from databases, but also people like from Intel, NVIDIA, uh, AMD, uh, SAP, uh, Oracle, they show how their databases work, how the software works. The things that NVIDIA was saying there uh, two years ago, they are only now appearing in their hardware. So this is a really interesting thing. Uh, by the way, how many of you read something like the Daily Morning Paper at least once a year? Okay, okay, so, so there will be a few papers showing you uh, that it's actually worth it. So if you don't, if you want to sleep through my, uh, my talk, no problem. But if you need to, uh, want to take one thing out of this, please read papers, especially those from 70s or 80s. They're, they're the best. So. Uh, at this conference, there was a keynote. Uh, as all good keynotes, it was fun and informative. Uh, and it went something like this. Let's take a biggest commercial data um, store by any company might have, apart from maybe Google, Facebook, Large Hadron Collider. You can buy a database that will uh, answer, uh, in, uh, answer any query on this data maybe in 2015, in 150 milliseconds, then 80, then 20, the human perception is about 200 milliseconds. So their conclusion at this conference was that the database is solved problems. There's no point in actually, what are we doing here? Why are we developing anything? There's no point here. So that's not what we were looking. But if you, if you think about buying databases, that's what they thought at that point, two years ago. Fortunately, we started reading papers uh, from, like, from 90s, from 80s. There were very interesting uh, things about how to optimize stuff, and few uh, were very notable. Let me show you one. Efficiently competing efficient query plans on modern hardware. If you look at those papers, most of them say doing something on modern hardware. But it was in the 90s, so probably it was two core server. But what the authors here did, they took some industry standard bench benchmark, which is some data set, some queries, and the vendors would take this data set queries, run it on their database, and report numbers. Okay, we are faster. We are faster than Oracle. We are faster than MySQL because this benchmark says that. So they took this benchmark, uh, ran one query on DBMS X. If you see this on, in a paper, probably it's Oracle. 28 seconds. That's how long it took. Then on MySQL 4, at that point, it was 27 seconds. MonoDB was a cutting edge columnar analytical, analytical data store at that time. It took 3.7 seconds. The last thing they did is they coded a C program that ran those query. It, I mean, it didn't uh, parse the query or it wasn't database. It just implemented the logic of the query. This was probably a first microservice. It was 220 milliseconds. So they showed that actually you can buy off-the-shelf stuff, uh, but you have a, a database on, running on customized hardware costing millions that is 100, 200 times, 100 times slower than a code you can hand count each C. So at that time, this was very influential paper. And this was a first hint that actually we're going to right direction in terms of looking for the reason to optimize stuff and how to do it. The, uh, the second paper is the best trolling I have s ever seen. The scalability, but at what cost? The idea here, Mr. Frank McSherry was the main author who then wrote many many blog posts about uh, follow-ups to this paper. They, uh, what they did is they took some data set from t Twitter. It was social media graph from Twitter. And they said, OK, there are several papers, several commercial or non-commercial systems saying, OK, 
we run on 16 servers or 128 servers. When you give us this data, we'll give you the result in 2,000 seconds. And this is state of the art. So there's one publication, like one publication that on Spark, you run this Twitter data set, and in uh, almost 2,000 seconds, you get the result. There are, were other state-of-the-art systems running on 16 on 20, 128 cores. Uh, this course is summary of all the cores, but these were distributed systems, so this, it was on many servers. And they said, OK, but we are now going to introduce some new candidates for the state-of-the-art. And these were uh, by writing some for loops on my laptop. So this, after reading this paper, uh, I will never look the same at all the clusters of sparks, uh, flings, and other stuff run at uh, the uh, other companies. You might go to people maintaining the system and ask them if they try to run this, this job that runs on 128 servers on their laptop. Because the result was that uh, 153 seconds. On, uh, uh, on one core, on the laptop. So the, the idea was here that there were some uh, inefficiencies built into all those systems. It's not their fault sometimes that it's so slow. It's because it's distributed or there are some other things. By the way, the data set was three gigabytes. So uh, this means that Actually, how, how it happens that they actually saw those results and said, hmm, there's something wrong with them. We can do better, and we can do much better. It's, it's uh, 128 times faster sometimes, 500 times faster. And what's interesting, the cost in the name of the paper, it's the configuration that outperforms single thread. So you have this cluster of sparks, and the cost of it is like, like 100. Means that 100 servers, will, you need to put 100 servers to, up, uh, to be faster than your single thread on a laptop. What's interesting, there were some platforms that had infinite cost. So no, uh, no configuration ever would be faster. But obviously, uh, like XCATCD says, Houston, we have a problem. Well, that's a negative. No, there are no problems, only opportunities. So this is opportunity for us, actually, to try to optimize something if we know that we can achieve uh, increase in 100, 1,000 times faster. There will be, I guess, no one will try to uh, say that, that it doesn't matter and it doesn't bring uh, value to the customer. So instead of 0 0.1, X developer, we can have 10 times developer. So, uh, but how can we uh, be like th those people? How can we uh, be those 10 times developers in the sense uh, in these papers? Well, they definitely had some intuition about what is possible on hardware, because if you see three gigabyte data set, crunched by 120 cores in 2,000 seconds, there's something wrong because you know that how much uh, uh, memory you have, how fast it is, how much, uh, how does, long does it take to read it from SSD and, and uh, stuff. And I will show you these things uh, that can impact on the hardware level, uh, impact these numbers and how we can achieve such improvements. All this will be in Java code there will be small sn snippets of Java code. On my GitHub is, is the full repo. Uh, it's Java because it's not abstract. If I tell you about some hardware things, it's not abstract and it's, you don't need to write assembly or C to actually, uh, to actually benefit from this because all the examples will be in Java. Then this means that all our Java code can do this. First, some refresh, uh, refresher of how the servers look like. This is an example of a two-socket server. Uh, there's a lot of moving things here. So I have only 20 minutes, so we will, uh, we will uh, look only at memory. Uh, we have cores. Cores communicate with uh, caches. So we have L1, L2 cache. Usually it's uh, core local. So uh, the core, uh, core has this cache 
just to itself, and it's inclusive. So if something is in L1, it's also in L2. The L3 cache, it's shared, shared and it's a victim cache. Victim means that if you load something here, and it means that you need to throw away something that was previously there, it will go to L3 cache. So in the, that, the idea is that you will probably need that soon, so it will be still close to you. Uh, there are memory controllers that connect to RAM, and what's interesting here is that this is a two-socket server, it looks like something like this, two sockets, and the RAM banks are connected to uh, individual processors. When we program, when we create variables in any language, we don't specify which, uh, uh, where this variable should be. Uh, we have a unified view of those memory banks, but it's not true, they are not equal. So, uh, in order to communicate and, and fetch data, for this core from here, they need a link between the processors. It's called on this graph QPI, Quick Path Interface. Uh, Intel has improved it, and Intel Marketing decided that Quick Path is not quick enough, so right now it's Ultra Path. It's obviously faster. Uh, AMD had something called Hyper Transport. Right now uh, it's called Infinity Fabric. So if there's something like too much Marvel, then you have it. Uh, but obviously it's faster than hypertransport, right? So this communication goes here. And because this RAM are in different uh, locations, this is something that's called NUMA domain. NUMA, which means non-uniform memory access. So if you're on in here and your program tries to access memory, Access here will obviously be faster than access here, but does it even matter? Well, it depends on processor architecture. You can have something like this. This is uh, AMD EPIC uh, part from uh, first or second generation, so it's Zen or Zen Plus. These are cores. CCX is a core complex. It's about four cores here. And you see that there are four controllers here, so there are four NUMA domains. Yeah, and if we are working here, our thread is here, and it wants to access memory that's here, then obviously we have, well, it depends how you read this, but there may, may be up to three hops to get to that memory. This is how uh, this, this processor, AMD processor, looks like if we uh, try to visu visualize the topology. This is the command to use it. Uh, fortunately, Amazon bought a lot of AMD uh, processors, so it's easy to compare because you can just uh, uh, buy the, process, uh, the, the servers on Amazon uh, from internal from AMD. So let's uh, try an experiment and see if this or location and collocation does matter. The experiment is like this. When we have even loop systems, when like Netty, uh, when uh, there are threads that are handing over tasks between them, this is something that will impact them. So, uh, because one thread needs to hand off uh, work to the other and needs to put some data somewhere and signal the other thread that it's already there. So, our experiment will be like this. Uh, uh, in core zero, we will have one thread. We we'll pin this thread there. So, actually, it will run, uh, we we'll make sure it runs there. There's some RAM that is the closest to this core and we'll put the variable there. We use it something like uh, atomic variable using unsafe. And in our experiment, we run threads on uh, different cores and measure how long does it take for those two to communicate in the sense that core zero will try to flip this variable from zero to one, and the other core, when it sees the change, it will try to flip the variable from one to zero. I use, this is the, the libraries I use, I use JMH and JNUMA. JNUMA is the library that will allow me to control where the, all this stuff is placed. Uh, do you guys know uh, JMH? No? Oh, okay. Are you sleeping? That's fine too. Uh, uh, Java Micro Benchmark Harness. 
you might uh, consider it something like JUnit for benchmarks. So there is a setup method and a benchmark method, and it was designed by Alexei Shipilev uh, to actually uh, circu circumvent, make sure that the, te the uh, code U benchmark is isolated and it's not gets uh, optimized away by JVM. So like the common problem would be if you run a for loop in main, then uh, JVM would uh, say, okay, this code does nothing, I will just remove it. So your benchmark will take zero milliseconds. And there's a lot of other stuff that's built in to make, uh, uh, to make benchmarking uh, better. But this is mi micro benchmark, so you can benchmark how, ma how fast it is to like, put variable into memory, flip a bit, or something like this. It's uh, or on a little bigger stuff, but it's still mi micro benchmarks. This is some code that will swap this. So we have one, one thread swapping flag from 0 to, uh, to 1, the other from 1 to 0. And this graph shows how long it takes. If we put both threads in the same NUMA domain, then it will take 220 nanoseconds. So we can see here if it's the same NUMA domain. If we're just unlucky, because we run JVM or GC moved everything somewhere else and Linux kernel moved the threads and one thread is here and the second thread is, uh, for example, here, it takes 500 nanoseconds and then it moves again and it will take, for example, 650 nanoseconds. So it's still fast, but it's only for one operation, you're losing three times the speed just by this, uh, locating it in a different place. This is the same graph, but it just shows uh, it in a different way, so we might skip it. Intel has simpler architecture because there's no, uh, there aren't so many uh, connections, so it was more consistent. We can see that here is one uh, time, and this is the second one. So there are only two domains, not six. Uh, okay, there's uh, another test is the read throughput. So we know that the latency will suffer if it's placed in a wrong uh, memory bank. But how about just reading this data? So we have terabytes of data in RAM and just we want, we want to just go through the RAM, uh, scanning it and doing some operation on it. So uh, this is a simple, uh, simple uh, test when we just pin the, the thread to some node and then go through byte buffer in eight bytes try to reading longs. There's simplest thing you can do in Java, you're just reading longs throughout the memory uh, and accumulating result. Then we return the result and JMH makes uh, sure that this is not optimized away. And it, uh, it is in, invokes this many, many times, so actually you can be uh, cer uh, quite certain about the, the results uh, and the rep uh, repeatability of the result. This is the result for AMD server that I, uh, I tested on. It's eight, almost 18 gigabytes per second. Think about this when you access some slow invoicing software or slow web page, that actually one thread can read 18 gigabytes of data out of the RAM. And we can see here, I tested this on a free, uh, three um, mm, NUMA domain uh, server, and it's, it doesn't matter how far it is, there's prefetcher, there are other mechanisms that work for us. So actually, on big server, uh, you can get more than 100 gigabytes of aggregated memory bandwidth from, uh, uh, for our calls. There are tools from Intel, for example, that can run you for you, this test for you and show you the numbers. So what this server is doing, if I go to Tauron web page and I want 12 invoices, so it probably runs on iPhone, right? From first generation, if I wait so uh, one minute for this. Uh, what are these numbers here? It's, uh, I changed the benchmark a little and I made the uh, accesses random. So instead of going through the memory in a linear fashion, it, it went to the same amount of memory, but randomly. And look, it takes, it's 400 megabytes instead of 18 gigabytes. 
So there are techniques to change if you can change the algorithm uh, that can change a random access into linear access and you, you can get how much? 10 times, uh, uh, you can get 20, 30, 40 times improvement in just in this. And here the NUMA domains matters because Prefetcher will not help you if the, is, if the stuff is far away from your core, you're paying even more for this. Um, okay, so why, if you write a program and you mm, have some algorithm, why it doesn't run at 80 gigabytes per second? Because obviously there are other uh, things that happen in a processor, in a JVM virtual machine. And uh, let's assume uh, a case. Uh, we have 100 million clients who bought something from your website or your app. We have a column in the database that says how many things they bought. It's integer. So it's 100 million clients, integer, so it's 400 gigabytes. And let's think, how fast can we go through this 400 megabytes and check how many people bought more than maybe 10 units of something? if these are just numbers. So based on this, it's a linear access. If we have 18 gigabytes per second, so probably we should go like, it should take about 12 milliseconds uh, to go through all this data, right? Uh, do you think that this is how it will turn out? There's, there's a quiz, but I, I guess it depends is the right answer. Uh, because uh, we have just eight minutes, so just go, let's go to the answer. This is how the, how the code looks like. We still get, go through the, uh, the buffer that we know is 400 gigabytes, uh, 400 megabytes, it's one mil, uh, for, uh, one, 100 million integers, and we evaluate the predicate. So we want to count here how many people both less than this number. So, uh, so how, fa how fast can it be? Uh, this is the result, and it depends obviously on the branch predictor, because if we go through this memory and evaluate the predicate, if no one bought anything and uh, the predicate always uh, matches or always fails, it is 43 milliseconds for this case on this server. But if someone if some people bought something from our, ser uh, our service and the predicate sometimes matches, sometimes fails, the branch predictor cannot predict what will happen next and we will uh, mispredict every time. So we we'll get 533 milliseconds. So depending on whether uh, our conditionals are predictable or not, we can get about 10 times uh, penalty for not, uh, for not being predictable here. Uh, the question is, can we do something about it? There's a lot of techniques uh, that can be uh, used. One of those techniques is, uh, was described in the 70s by no, no one other but Leslie Lamport, and uh, the person for, uh, known for uh, for Paxos algorithm, right? So uh, he said, if you, we not get into this, but if you get a set of uh, binary operations, okay, you, s you have, for example, a predicate saying 42. Count how many records match 42 or are lower than or greater than. If you apply several uh, operations like masking, XOR, and, to the incoming values and this 42, in the end, you will get one here if it matches and zero if it doesn't match. So we can replace this if with some set of instructions that will return one if it matches and zero if it doesn't match. Here, it's, it's very convenient because we want to count this, so we just add this one to result, right? So instead of the if, we get something like this. We get value from the buffer, we do and, uh, we do XOR, we do and, we do mask, we add, we replace it with a lot of instructions, right? So 
how fast it can be. Oh, and we do bit count. So it's a lot of instructions instead of simple if. It's 97 milliseconds. It means it's slower than the best case, but if the branch predictor misses only 5% of times, this technique is already faster. And what's great about this technique is that if you know your value will match, uh, the highest value will fit in, for example, byte or short, and you have a largest register of long, then you can put many such values in a long, apply all those arithmetic operations, and you will get vectorized processing for free, even without vector registers, because this, uh, these operations will not interfere with each other, and you can pack those values into one register, and I did it in the, the, the code. You can look at it up on GitHub. It's even 11 milliseconds. So this is a theoretical limit. And here we are running at the speed of memory. It doesn't matter if uh, 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 there's no branch predictor here. The whole logic, the database, you can write this way a database. And I, I guess it will be faster than many. Uh, obviously, this technique is not always great. There's a uh, Doom on GitHub that was compiled, compiled by a compiler that does not use branches. It uses only MOV instructions. The problem is that it renders one frame every seven hours. So it is not always the best uh, and only uh, way to, uh, to go. Uh, so summing up, there's two kinds of developers or ski set that one might have. Uh, 0.1x, 10, point, uh, 10 times developer. These two hats are not exclusive. You can wear both of them, uh, depending on the situation. If we want to go and optimize, this is something uh, what is required. O obviously, if you need to, because you might working, be working on IBM, and you can uh, spend uh, years on optimizing stuff, and then the project goes, go, goes uh, to the um, uh, trash can, and no one cares, right? But most companies do doesn't want to spend all those money. So uh, you should please read papers, experiment, develop the intuition of what is possible uh, on current hardware, on future hardware, on hardware you're using. Uh, and uh, that's it. So the answer is it depends. But we, with proper tools, we should know better and be able to decide. Thanks. <laughs>